So we are starting. Uh, all right. After. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the MIT uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab celebrated its uh, 50th anniversary uh, uh, last week, and. Um, uh, we had a nice conference uh, at my Are you um, well, the What's that? Oh, well, hey. It seems to be one, yeah. It's a really green one. Is there a way to turn it up, you know? Uh, yes, the boss left. Can you hear me? There are we. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Who knows how this machine works? All engineers. Well, it is certainly on, yes, but I don't think it can. There is no volume. Yeah, that I cannot. This is no volume. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Oh, wow. Engineers figured it out. That's too high. See the screw one. Is the case still? The answer is yes? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. All right. As I was saying, um, we had a, a conference celebrating the 50th anniversary of Project Mac at MIT, which is sort of what was there before the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And many people talk about progress in the field, and in particular, uh, some stunning successes of uh, artificial intelligence applications. And you see some of them here on the screen, uh, Agile, and the Kinect, and Watson, and Siri. Um, but of course, when you look a bit more carefully at these gadgets, um, at the systems, you will uh, see that uh, none of them would be said to be truly intelligent. Uh, in part because they don't have any knowledge about the world outside of their narrow area of uh, expertise. Uh, if we go back to uh, one of the grand challenges of our center, um, you see they want to create a computational system that would uh, look at the visual scenes, uh, answer questions about them, and describe them uh, the way humans do. Um, so as you uh, can imagine, um, these tasks require quite a few um, abilities of natural language processing, whether it's language understanding, uh, language generation, and question answering. And this is what I will be mostly uh, talking about uh, this morning, uh, but um, I will start uh, by giving you uh, a brief history of uh, computer vision, because uh, that is certainly part of our test, and um, uh, sort of as told to me by a colleague, uh, Antonio Toralba. So 50 years ago, if you were to give a machine uh, an image like that, um, well, the machine will tell you that can possibly handle even one, uh, one image uh, like that. Uh, but it will not even fit in them. Going forward uh, 25 years ago, uh, this point is black and white. Uh, someone gave them their vision system uh, image like that and asked it to label objects of the type that Shimon was describing. And this is what uh, the answer was. So the machines saw sheep, and beds, and horses, and, and airplanes. Uh, 
uh, of course, much progress uh, uh, happened during 25 years that passed, and uh, just a few months ago, um, a student of Antonio's uh, gave it this uh, image, and the machine said, Brad. Well, it is, as you all know, it's really amazing, exciting times for computer vision. We have these great gadgets like Kinect, and the cell phones can do magic, and the cameras that can easily see your faces, machines drive themselves, we have robots. Um, so this is now a, a real story of a student um, at our lab who decided that he wants to do machine vision. Everyone told me, this is awesome, look at all these wonderful images we have, uh, just pick one. Uh, also we have this fantastic data set, we have ImageNet that Shimon mentioned a while ago, it has millions of images, we have, before that we had Caltech, we have Pascal, just train your system and see what it could do. Well, he did. And then uh, he gave it this image. Well, we of course uh, know what you see in this image, but his system said this car. Well, uh, this is a wonderful English expression. If you all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, if, when he started investigating what happened, um, well, there is a image patch right there, circled by, by his system, and if you uh, try to find out what his detector sees, it actually sees something that sort of looks like a car. Uh, so why is, why is this happening? Um, uh, let's look a little bit more general uh, on a bunch of images and see what in general do we want. Uh, uh, recognition, the scene recognition system to do. Well, some of the standard tasks used in, in field are uh, things like verification, you want to know whether this is a street lamp or not, uh, detection, you want to know whether people in the scene, uh, or uh, object categorization, you want the machine to tell you that it is mountains here, buildings, uh, people, trees, and, and, and so forth. Uh, activity. Uh, you want the machine to be able to tell you what is this guy doing there, or what are these two people doing there. Uh, humans are, of course, uh, absolutely remarkable. Uh, uh, verification, detection, uh, categorization, things like that. Humans do spatial and temporal relationship with ease, uh, same as event recognition. They can do even more. They can explain things to you just by looking at an image, what past event caused the scene to look as it does now. They can predict things, what future event will happen at the scene. Uh, they can hallucinate and fill gaps about the scene, what object that are included, visible in the scene, might also be present there, or what events uh, may have or could have occurred. Um, well, let me prove to you how awesome humans are uh, at many of these tasks. So I'll show you a blurry video example, and uh, uh, maybe you can tell me what you see here. Anybody wants to say what they see? Someone, please. I type on a computer. Yeah. Uh, and the, the man at the computer with his mouse and things like that. Well, uh, humans make mistakes too, so uh, please take a look what you actually saw. <laughs> so, you know, this guy had a shoe, uh, he put some beer cans on his head, and he types away in front of the trash can, he uses a stapler, and, there's a, and, and, and so on and so forth. But to tell you the truth, I would be ecstatic if any of our vision system could make such mistakes. <coughs> so, why our machines fall short? Um, well, one of the reasons um, is that our vision system is tuned to process structures which are typically found in the world, but our machines just don't know enough about the world and they don't know what is typical in the world and uh, therefore uh, they do the silliness that we sometimes see. So let's ask a few questions. Uh, how uh, is this knowledge that humans are so good at uh, 
if we obtain, um, how can we pass this knowledge to our machines, and uh, how can we determine uh, whether the computer knowledge is correct. So our, I, I bolded here the word partial. Uh, so our partial answer is using language, because of course there are many other means uh, that we humans acquire knowledge, and um, uh, other members of our group will talk about it in the afternoon, for example. Uh, but uh, since my talk is about language, so let's concentrate on what knowledge a language system uh, can give to, to a vision system. So the proposal is to create a knowledge base containing descriptions of objects, their properties, relations between them as they typically found in the world, and make this knowledge base available uh, to a vision system. And test the performance of the system by uh, as I'm showing you this sort of center challenge uh, of uh, we will test it by asking natural questions. Um, a student in our group wanted to see how actually much knowledge people use uh, to when they look at images in order to understand them. And so he asked Mechanical Turk people uh, to look at several hundred images and write down questions that they think an image like that would answer. And so here are some, some pictures. So people wanted to know how, picture, how many people are in the photo, what's in the cart, uh, is anybody walking, is there any luggage? Uh, in this example, people want to see uh, what number is displayed or what color is the backpack in the chair. Um, in this image, uh, someone asked, what is the object that is parked in front of a fence? Just think about the knowledge that is involved. Of course, the question was about the stroller, but your machine needs to know that only cars uh, can be parked, but things like stroller and uh, uh, that uh, animate objects are not usual things, and therefore this woman who is standing next to the fence is not a good candidate. Uh, who is winning yellow or red? Um, well, we need to know that yellow and red mean people wearing these colors, that we have paying no attention to people in the audience wearing these colors, that it's a sports event, uh, usually involves winners and losers, and if somebody's on the floor, it's like a loser, and things like that. A lot of knowledge. Um, so we built a system which we call START. Um, that provides a number of natural English tools. Uh, the tools, uh, at least des described here, are um, an ability to go from natural English text to some semantic structure, which is providing machines with new knowledge, the ability to go back from that semantic representation into natural English text, which is a generator, and finally, the ability to test machines, uh, how it understood uh, what you told it or what you told it to do, and um, you give it a question, it will convert it to semantic representation, and the machine will either reply, do something, and this way how we will know that how that succeed. Here are some of the building blocks of our system. Um, I will not have time to go through, um, through all of them, but I will describe some to give you a sense of how the system works, and in fact, uh, hopefully, uh, if you're interested, you could uh, ask us to give you some of our tools and add to um, So the first thing that a uh, language system uh, does when it looks a sentence, takes the sentence as an input and here's a sentence from Tom Sawyer on the top, um, it needs to analyze it. So linguists usually analyze sentences using these beautiful parse trees, but uh, some of you who tried, uh, this is a not a very good representation <coughs> for a machine. So what we propose instead uh, is to use, of course, the syntactic information in these parse trees, but uh, give the machine a more semantic representation, which we call the turn expression representation. So this is a versatile syntax-driven representation of language. It uh, nicely highlights uh, interesting semantic relations that you want to know about. And it is important, it's very efficient for indexing, for matching, <coughs> and for retrieval. Uh, and I'll very quickly show you examples of this representation. Uh, this is that same sentence. Um, instead of that uh, scary uh, parse tree, you see a nice set of uh, turn expression triples, which pretty much describe the whole sentence. Uh, one triple 
any two of these representations can point to another. So it actually looks like a linear set is in fact uh, a semantic network. Um, and we distinguish uh, a number of types um, of uh, ternary expressions. Uh, the ones that related to the syntax, syntactic structure of the sentence, uh, with another set related to syntactic features, uh, and also some lexical features. And this is a screenshot of the system, and again, it gives you access to all the systems if you wanted to, uh, that uh, show you, uh, I guess, that a different the sentence uh, from, I guess, Hemingway. Old man and C, and you see in the black uh, the syntactic structures of the sentence, uh, then uh, the features, and, and the bottom, uh, some semantic features. Um, now we will need to be able to take these structures, uh, if the machine has them in their brain, or just take them either from analyzing sentences or from analyzing the world, and see if we can convert such nice semantic presentations. Into, uh, into language. And there are many reasons why you want to do it. You want a robot to be able to explain its actions to you. You want a machine question answering system to answer complex questions. You want to track a conversation. Uh, you want to have a mixed initiative dialogue with the machine and, and many other reasons why um, you want uh, to be able, a machine to be able to generate nice things, uh, sentences and characters. And this is an example of our generator in action. Uh, that's that same sentence um, from uh, the old man and the sea, but uh, we added and modified some of the relations um, that machine obtained from the original sentence. And it was able to generate a much uh, more convoluted sentence. And it's a crazy looking sentence, of course. It's, in fact, it's a question because we told some of it that we wanted to turn to a question. Uh, but that gives you an ability, uh, sort of a view of what uh, kind of languages our system can generate if you want them to. Well, so now we know how to uh, take a sentence, create structure, and we know how to generate an, an, uh, an answer, uh, a sentence or an answer given structure. So let's see how we can use a question answer. So uh, let's look at that same sentence about Tom Sawyer and uh, say someone asks, was anybody sitting by an open window? Uh, the machine on the left will create turn expressions from the question, and on the right would be the assertion in the knowledge base that the machine got uh, from analyzing the original sentence. As you could see, there's some easy looking matches, and this is what these look like on the semantic network uh, representation. And the matcher, yeah, say sure, we could, we could match that. So the matcher uh, in our system, and in fact, uh, many syntactically based uh, question answering system needs to happen on many levels. It needs to happen on level of words. You want to know that uh, similar words are similar, that syn synonyms would be similar, that hyponyms uh, need to work one way and not the other. Um, but much harder is matching the level of structure, uh, because uh, in most languages, the same thought could be expressed in many different ways syntactically, and uh, they mean the same, and you want the language system to be able to answer questions were formulated in one way uh, and match to assertions that machine had formulated in another. So I'll say a few words about what we call transformational S rules, just because I find it interesting so from a linguistic point of view. Um, so let's look at a... a few English verbs. So let's look at the verb like surprise. And let's look at a sentence that's a very common English sentence. The patient surprised the doctor with his fast recovery. And as you all know, the same sentence could be rephrased uh, by something like the patient's fast recovery surprised the doctor. If you look at the structure, they're very, very different. It's a syntactic structure, but they mean completely the same thing. Another verb, load. The crane loaded the ship with containers, and the crane loaded containers on the ship. This is a different alternation from the surprise Provide. Uh, did the run provide Syria with weapons, or did the run provide weapons to Syria? Again, it's yet a third type of uh, alternation. 
And one can think that we have these wonderful verbs that allow us to say anything anyway, but if you try to use, uh, for example, the load of the nation for the verb surprise, you get complete gibberish. The patient surprised fast recovery onto the doctor. Or if you want to use the um, load of uh, the surprise alternation with the word load, you get another type of uh, gibberish. The cranes containers loaded the ship, and, and, and so and so on. So the stars, by the way, indicate that it's a working sentence and no one can speak with approval. Um, so this is very interesting. Um, so we started looking quite a while ago, a number of linguists to look at these verbs, and, um, uh, and they realized that, in fact, uh, there is some semantic regularity to this alternation. So let's look again at the verb surprise, and you see that many other verbs, in fact, in English, several hundred verbs, undergo the same alternation. So you could confuse or anger or disappoint or embarrass the doctor with fast recovery and so on and so forth. Um, and if you look at these verbs uh, a bit more carefully, you actually see that they have similar meaning. They belong to the same semantic class. So this is an interesting intersection between syntax and semantic that I think people should pay quite a lot of attention to. And so what our system does, instead of trying to teach the machine for every verb what kind of alternation it can or cannot do, we, we can do that much more generally on the level of verb classes, which will make for much more uh, easily to deal with the uh, lexicon. Uh, it, it's also interesting that I invented the verb. Someone the, the other day used Galagai example. So if I invent the verb, the verb that you never knew and show it to you, and you know, like jumping from the ceiling at me and you know, surprising or scaring me with something like that, but it would be a completely different verb that, like, you know, uh, what should we say? Devil, <laughs> say, you know, uh, student Devil Boris with his jump. Um, if you see from the video what that means, you will eventually start using the, the verb with a different alternation without anybody telling you anything else. So this is this amazing ability by humans uh, to understand semantic classes of English verbs, and uh, we don't know how it works. So it will be very interesting to study. Well, anyway, so we know how to analyze sentences, and we know how to match, so it's time to actually uh, give answers. Um, so if you ask uh, start a system uh, that I just told you, was anybody uh, sitting by an open window, uh, you parse it, you match it, you come up with the match, and our generator can, of course, nicely generate the sentence just back to you, which is not at all interesting. We could say, again, Tom sent was sitting by an open window in an apartment. But uh, a much more interesting application is when you ask a system a question that you actually don't know the answer to, and the system needs to do something to give you the answer. So the example below is what uh, is our star system uses in its question answering. Uh, in response to a match that I described you about, it, it executes a script uh, to go to some uh, knowledge repository, in this case in the web, uh, get the answer back, and generate a nice answer. So the example here is who directed Gone with the Wind, and the answer was that Gone with the Wind was directed by three people who were planning and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, here are some screenshots of the SART system that use this ability to perform a procedure in response to a match. Uh, the question was, does Russia border Moldova? And the machine, the machine went to a, a particular website, in this case, World Factbook, found out all the countries that border Moldova, looked whether uh, Russia was on the list, didn't find it, and says Moldova does not border Russia. Uh, when of course, you try to go to a search engine, uh, you get some kids, but they really do not answer the question at all. They talk about other things. This ability to be, to be able to analyze uh, uh, English sentences uh, precisely gives you a lot of power. It allows you to uh, answer much more complex questions with little lookup questions that I described to you. Uh, 
by breaking them apart. So the example here, and again, it's especially uh, convoluted, but just to show you how these things are done, uh, the question is, who is the president of the fourth largest country married to? And the system needs to figure out that, in fact, there's more than one question and, and, and this larger question, and I'll show you how it's actually done sort of in, under the hood view of for this sort of syntactic decomposition. So this is uh, the T expressions from the question. Uh, start says, no, it's just far too hard to answer it all to, uh, right away. So let me try, and we have a nice uh, linguistical-based, syntactical-based algorithm that t tells you in which order to resolve um, these expressions. And the machine says, no, first we'll figure out what is the largest country, uh, in fact, what is the fourth largest country, and find China. And then it says, okay, now I can uh, try to answer a much simpler question. Uh, who is the president of China married to. Uh, but even then was already hard, but then the machine noticed that you can easily find the president of China. Uh, and then there was only one simple question about him, uh, and the machine just gave you it. Uh, here are some of the examples of uh, that start performing the, uh, this complex question answering. In what city was the fifth president of the US born? Uh, Start says, I know the fifth president of the USA is James Monroe, and then it told you that it was born in Monroe, Virginia, from different sources, in fact, from Wikipedia, from uh, Internet Public Library, and from IMDb. So, similar. Yeah. Does the system have any way of dealing with any duty? The question you had what's the fourth largest country? Yeah. Uh, that's right, and in fact, this is, there are many types of ambiguities and there are structural ambiguities, there are semantic ambiguities, and in fact, in a talk this afternoon, Andre will tell you much more about the syntactic ambiguity that we plan to work on. Uh, this example that you said, that required the system to understand that largest could mean largest by number of people or largest by the area, and the system uh, selected, uh, I forgot, I believe the area uh, in this particular example, uh, because it liked it better, but we, at this point, there is no learning involved. It just, we tell the system you can use either or in a particular order, it decides in which order. But it automatically does things like, uh, if you if you can analyze a lot of adjectives, it knows what property to look at. So if you say, uh, if you ask what is, uh, how deep is the Black Sea, it will know to look at steps uh, of attributes or of a particular object rather than some. So it actually analyzes the, the semantics of um, And if it's ambiguous, it's something gives you some answers at the same time. Um, Right, so, so uh, this ability to automatically, as I showed you, to decompose uh, a question and break it into pieces and on the fly manufacture a set of procedures is quite useful uh, to what, in fact, Shimon alluded to in his talk. Uh, suppose we see an image or a video and you want the machine to ask questions about it. So what we could do instead of executing a prefabricated procedure, we could automatically, after analyzing the question and creating certain expressions, we can automatically produce some, some formal representation out of it, which is, Shimon suggested, some directed calculus, that could be others, which is what we're looking at right now, which will then be converted into a call for a bunch of visual procedures against the type where Shimon was talking to and actually automatically find the, uh, the answers to the questions or find image patches or images of or pieces of video that, that uh, actually respond to this question. Uh, so uh, we'll have a couple of minutes left. I will show you some uh, recent progress uh, and we will, you'll hear much more about it from Andre this afternoon. Uh, the ability of our more recent system to understand and describe activities in video, and sort of trying to go beyond bounding boxes uh, and towards uh, generating uh, responses uh, to questions. So, uh, so here is a video, um, and the question to the system was who approached the bin? Um, so after analysis of the video and analysis of the question, 
the machine uh, responded uh, the person to the right of the bed, which I, not only looks like magic, but uh, to me it feels like magic. But Andre this afternoon will tell you much more about how this magic happens, and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll believe that that might actually. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, uh, if uh, we're successful, and hopefully we will be in, uh, in some near future, uh, if uh, our machine gets an image like this, it will be able to uh, recognize the objects, uh, tell you that this is an amusement park, that people are walking, that there's a stroller. It will be able to uh, answer queries, uh, what is parked in front of the fence, uh, any people looking at each other. And it even will be able to generate a narrative or say, look at this uh, picture or a video and say it's a sunny day at the amusement park. That one young mother rolled up blue jeans is wait waiting with her baby by the carousel and, and so on and so forth. And next time I hope to give a talk to you guys, we'll show you some of that. Oh, thank you. Today, she said, set up this way. Oh, wait. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, I have like, actually two questions, if you don't mind. Um, so, the first is just dealing with, depending on what language somebody speaks, uh, there can be some very interesting syntactic features or, or features of a language that don't exist in other ones. So, take, for example, in uh, African American vernacular in English, uh, double negation doesn't necessarily make a positive, it just means something is more negative, right? right? So, dealing with things like that, where the logical structure itself can be very different, is that so they can be uh, easily approached? And then I'll uh, try my second question first, I'll let you answer first. Well, nothing is easily approached. As for the last few days, you, I guess, discovered that. Uh, but uh, as uh, strange it looks to uh, sort of standard English speakers, uh, the language that most groups speak, in fact, have structure and have grammars. As you know, sign languages have real serious grammars. Uh, so then, they could be analyzed and, and, uh, and understood and eventually used in systems here. Yeah, I think it's something to. And what's your second question? Uh, so the second question has to do with um, an interesting feature. I don't know if it has a name or not, but something that I've noticed in Hawaiian pidgin. Mm -hmm. So this word, uh, the kind. Have you heard of it before? No. Okay, so, so if you go to Hawaii and you talk to native speakers, they will often have sentences like, like give, me the, give me the the kind from the kind. And so basically, the sentence itself is entirely context-dependent, and you only know what they're talking about if you know the person and what they're dealing with. Right. So for, for different people, they know exactly what they what they're talking about because they know this person wants the coffee or they want this and that. But to somebody else, it's really you can't penetrate it. So if you spend enough time with with like a family over there or people you know, eventually you get to know it. But I feel like if you try to understand it from a something like this, you need to have some sort of extra uh, module on there, something like a theory of mind to say, oh, this person. Uh, usually likes hot dogs, and so they want a hot dog, or something like that. And I, so I wonder if there's any way that that could be approached in a nice uh, manner. Yeah, I imagine uh, at some point, but to me, it is at this point sounds like luxury. We are so behind the simple things that you want to do that uh, certainly is an interesting problem, but we, we need to solve, I believe, more fundamental problems first. One can imagine approaches to examples by actual understanding each person will at some point during the system to know about him and, he, and, and use this knowledge uh, to answer specific questions after recognizing you. Um, and it's, again, it's an interesting problem, but uh, we don't know how to do very simple things, and that's what we're working on. Thank you. All right, so maybe we should uh, give Danny a chance. Uh, but I, I'm around uh, all day, so let's talk. And as I said, uh, if you guys want to uh, use any of our systems, we'll be absolutely happy to give it to you. So, uh, uh, I'll go back a little bit to uh, the, what the Shimon has told us before about the, um, the uh, uh, vision system, way it, um, um, uh, we, we are humans uh, know how to recognize and uh, detect things in our surroundings. And I will focus on the, uh, um, the way this uh, ability uh, develop uh, humans and uh, how we would like to do them uh, in AI systems. 
So this is a joint work with uh, Imrod, uh, Dorfman, and uh, Shimon. Uh, so, uh, as Shimon so, it said, uh, most of the visual perception tasks that uh, um, AI systems are used to deal with are uh, mostly related to object recognition and action recognition, uh, but we would like to do a larger range of uh, human visual perception tasks. And the major approaches uh, that currently um, are available to the computer vision is either supervised methods where you have a, a, a label trained uh, data with uh, labels for uh, objects and the actions, uh, the old kind of uh, concept, and then you will learn a classifier in order to discriminate between the different uh, categories. But it really doesn't seem a, a very uh, scalable approach in order to cope with uh, at least uh, uh, 30,000 object categories, and the much more categories for actions and the, uh, human interactions and stuff. This, um, so the unsupervised approach is at the other end of this uh, spectrum where data is completely uh, unlabeled and then uh, most of the methods are working on uh, statistical analysis, trying to learn common patterns uh, within this data. But again, uh, sometimes most, sometimes the, the concept that we would like to learn from this uh, visual data is uh, not very salient, it's actually very subtle in the data. And these statistical methods are find it very hard uh, to learn. So, we might, we might learn with the current approaches about uh, this uh, action of uh, a man that is walking a dog, but how about this uh, instance of, of the action? So this is very rare, but still humans can do uh, very good and understand what's going on. Uh, how about physical laws? Um, we humans can say exactly what's going to happen predict, and by the way, don't worry, because there's a mattress here <laughs> to make it to the ground safety, but uh, uh, this is uh, much difficult for AI systems. And also, by looking uh, at a single image, uh, we can say so much about the uh, social interactions and the relationships between the, the people uh, uh, in the scene, and uh, something that AI systems uh, can, cannot uh, deal with it uh, as uh, the approaches are, are currently early. So, how uh, do we uh, humans uh, do so well on this task? Uh, we can go back to uh, infancy and see that newborns actually have very limited capacities on many uh, uh, visual recognition tasks. They do have some face recognition uh, capabilities. Uh, they are quite good at uh, tracking motion of different types, but they don't have any uh, optic segregation capabilities, no gestalt cues, and uh, still they, they manage to uh, develop these uh, uh, capabilities in the very first few months of, of life. So I will focus on, the, on this kind of uh, developmental learning uh, due to uh, the time limitation uh, will probably go only uh, for this uh, social understanding uh, uh, search. Yeah. So one thing is we covered in the journal club the PNAS paper. So you might be able to go through that a little more quickly. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. So that, that's a good part. So I'll go quickly on that and then maybe we can manage to, uh, to talk a little more, more about the social understanding. Uh, uh, of course. Um, so, uh, just a short uh, uh, overview about this. Uh, so, we would like to find hands uh, uh, an image, then uh, I guess the common patterns would not be a very good uh, idea to look for because hands are very variable in their uh, appearance. Uh, and also, motion. If we would like to uh, to think about uh, uh, the 
in the way that we uh, usually uh, see hands of in interaction. Uh, motion alone is not uh, uh, enough because there is much motion around us, uh, which is not related to hands. So, therefore, uh, again, we go back to the to the infants, and we see that infants, for example, are not uh, just uh, sensitive to motion, but they are sensitive to different types of motion, uh, like launching and active and passive uh, kind of motion. And there is uh, much uh, developmental work uh, about uh, about uh, young infants that uh, learn how to. Uh, uh, relate uh, hands with the agency events uh, at the very early age uh, or in the first year of life. So, uh, as you probably went through the paper, uh, we said the notion of, uh, of mover detection in which uh, motion comes into a, a certain place and then after the motion is uh, out, the, the change in the appearance of this uh, in this uh, place. Uh, for this, we actually don't need anything related to object detection uh, or s even segmentation, uh, just the analysis of uh, this motion, uh, this optical flow in this specific region, and a very short uh, memory about the, the appearance that was there in this uh, spot just before the motion came in. Um, so this is a short video uh, showing the result of this uh, um, mover detector. So just general motion does uh, not trigger the, the event detector, but whenever there is an interaction of an object on uh, another passive object, then triggers the, the detector. Sometimes there's a noisy event, but still the, the ball here they did move the, the, the car. So our algorithm is uh, uh, able to, to pick up those uh, events. And uh, our assumption is that in the uh, vicinity of infants during the, the first month of age, uh, this kind of events are highly correlated with uh, the appearance of, of health. And uh, that's uh, that's a nice internal teaching signal that then they can start and pick up and learn about the hand appearance. So we go further and expand our appearance sample by relating the body features to the hand appearance. And after a very short uh, iterations on, on training the examples like this, uh, no uh, supervised uh, labeling, uh, we managed to uh, track, uh, detect and track the, the hands. Uh, so this is uh, whenever it's green, it's a detection first frame. We do not analyze the, uh, the motion for the detection. And uh, yellow, when the, there's no detection, but uh, track to the emotion. Um, so here we can see just the improvement on the performance. So while the, this uh, uh, agenda curve is the uh, um, performance, by the way, everybody is familiar with precision photographs. So in contrast with the ROC curve, uh, that the, the, the best performance is going to be on the uh, so left corner, so uh, percentage of photographs typically have the best performance uh, on the upper right corner. Um, and here you can you can see that the performance is not that great, but the thing that you note is that for uh, a certain recall uh, threshold, there is a very high precision uh, performance. In this case, uh, we can uh, take just the, the best scoring example, be quite confident that they will actually be uh, enhanced. And therefore, we can alternatively uh, uh, take this kind of, uh, of examples as a positive label uh, hand and uh, do the co training procedure and increase the performance uh, quite uh, 
uh, rapidly. Uh, the red curve here is just if we were trained the algorithm on the label. So this is the best thing that the, the appearance uh, model. Um, so uh, another task that uh, we wanted to, uh, to learn is about uh, direction of gaze. Uh, and again, uh, our uh, motivation was uh, the ability of uh, infants to uh, follow the, the other person gaze direction. It's quite useful for learning about uh, the, the environment, uh, which uh, objects are uh, are manipulable. Uh, later on, also to learn about uh, uh, object names and language. Uh, so we we search for uh, a nice and easy uh, way to to learn about this, uh, but still in an unsupervised way because we. Uh, for instance, at least, there's no uh, uh, easy uh, way to give them labels about that. Um, so we would like to associate uh, face images uh, with uh, specific directions, and this analysis was done for 2D, and currently uh, uh, standard is also for 3D. And then uh, once we have this uh, couple of face appearances and uh, in directions, uh, we can train a very simple uh, nearest neighbor algorithm, and whenever uh, we have a square uh, image, we can associate it with uh, uh, similar images uh, of faces and then have uh, the direction. So how can we uh, create this kind of uh, training set? So again, we went back to uh, mover events, and then uh, we associate any uh, mobile event with uh, the direction from the face to the place where the hand manipulated the object, and uh, it's, it's a very hot, a very strong uh, teaching signal for this uh, directional case because it can know for itself. Uh, almost whenever you go pick up some, something or try to put it down, uh, you look where it are reaching the direction. Um, so these are kind of training uh, examples, and uh, we actually don't use the very high resolution uh, face images. Uh, we represent these images with the Hogwarts descriptor that uh, Shimon uh, spoken about it before, and then uh, uh, giving the, the algorithm, applying it to test images. Uh, by the way, it's a full generalization, uh, whenever the face of the person that's the set the algorithm haven't seen the kind of face in the training set. So here you can see uh, the results in red to the model prediction and green so two uh, human uh, annotators that were presented with the same images and were asked uh, to mark the, the direction of the, of, uh, the data. So of course there's also uh, some uh, uh, misdirections, uh, but in general uh, the, the performance is quite good. And as you can see, the red curve, which is the algorithm, the performance is quite similar to the performance here in, in green. Um, so I went through this um, uh, work uh, briefly. Uh, I have time now to speak about uh, a study that is more related to scene understanding and then maybe further uh, to uh, know something about uh, objects and their functionality around us. And um, object segregation, in that sense, uh, is also something which is learned and not, uh, not innate. Uh, this uh, work, for example, um, it has been shown that uh, if adults are being shown with this kind of, uh, of uh, um, an object which have different uh, appearances uh, and is occluded at the middle uh, versus this uh, this object, so adults were uh, uh, habituated to this kind of display 
uh, tested by these two couples uh, of images. Uh, and for this one, uh, they uh, uh, predict that this is the, uh, the actual the object that is behind the occluder. And for this one, uh, they tend to uh, uh, perceive it as two different objects. And for, uh, for infants, uh, so uh, when they are younger than seven months, uh, they don't have any preference for either of the, of the objects, uh, meaning that they don't have any good predictions of how the, how the object uh, looks like. But uh, around seven months of age, they already uh, predict and have a longer preferential looking at this kind of object. Uh, meaning that they already start to build up some gestalt on a good continuation of, uh, of the object here behind the occluder, but they do not have any prediction yet on, uh, on this kind of object, which has different texture. And it's only uh, later on, by the age of, of uh, a year, and sometimes they spend two years, that they learn to receive this kind of uh, 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 gestalt cubes that uh, allow them to achieve this group of this like So adults have a very uh, strong capacity uh, for segregated objects if they're very clouded the scene. So how, how can we do it? Um, so we believe that it all begins with motion. So the uh, first type of motion is common, common motion. And uh, the, the second type of motion is the motion discontinuity that can actually, uh, even uh, in very uh, complex appearance, uh, can give us a very good sense of what is a figure and what is the ground. Um, so the task uh, that we are interested in is to segregate the object in a static image. But we would like to learn uh, how to segregate the objects in this, uh, in this uh, image uh, in an unsupervised way. So we start with the motion-based uh, segregation. And we first uh, detect motion discontinuities and uh, extract local inclusion uh, boundaries that are along this motion discontinuity. And we create some kind of a, a large dictionary of features that are really uh, discriminate for uh, these boundaries between the object foreground and the back. And then, uh, again, using the motion basic segregation, uh, we use the common motion, uh, the temporal continu con continuance of, uh, of uh, objects uh, moving around, and create a short-term object form, uh, we don't need to know what kind of object it, it is, but uh, for a very short uh, period of time, uh, just by the common motion, we can uh, segregate objects from the, from the data. And we can learn something about its appearance, uh, at least uh, as a certain scope uh, that we are interested in. So uh, this kind of uh, Occlusion cues appear when we uh, extract the features uh, along the boundaries. So this is not uh, from our study. It, uh, uh, it was a study that we there, uh, but you see the different types of uh, 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 occlusion cues, like T junction, uh, or you can say, can you say where is the front? Uh, what is the figure and what is the background? Who says it's uh, on the right? Yeah, on the left. Okay. So it's a very uh, strong uh, cue. Uh, and there, there are other two uh, basic uh, types, which is one, the, the context. Uh, so the complexity uh, suggests that the more complex parts in the, the foreground. And then there's also a very interesting uh, uh, cue about stream images. Uh, 
this is something which is uh, very typical to uh, uh, to natural images. It's very hard to uh, reproduce this in, in synthetic data. Uh, so you can see here the different kinds of reflections and the changes in, in, in lightning. Uh, but it's a very strong cue. And actually, many of you probably saw, uh, saw it also with the artists that are drawing the, all kinds of uh, context and the, and the uh, containers of stuff like that. They, they do have this kind of shading, but it, it's a very strong cue to perceive uh, depth uh, information. Uh, so about the, the object, uh, sometimes these cues are very uh, are not enough. So uh, to, discri to discriminate the, the object, <coughs> you actually need something more holistic in order to uh, try and figure out where where are the bottom. So uh, this is the way we, we do it. So we start with a moving object, uh, and if, as you can see, it can even be on a, a very cluster similar background, uh, we extract these boundary features around the, around the motion continuities, and we associate these uh, features with the direction of the figure uh, of the object. And we, of course, assume that uh, the, the moving part is uh, the figure, and uh, this is a, a good assumption if we uh, um, we, 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 we think that the uh, motion attracts most of our attention, and once we focus on something which is moving, so in, in a very uh, local uh, region around this uh, motion, uh, it's, it's uh, usually the, the only motion that is there in a very uh, uh, bounded uh, neighborhood. Uh, so these are kind of uh, patches that were extracted automatically uh, from the this motion discontinuities. And as you can see, we, without searching for specific uh, uh, types of uh, boundaries, we actually extract those contacts, uh, those extremal edges, and some uh, E junctions, uh, pretty similar to, to the other uh, study. Uh, the, the, the thing that we noted here is that in order to use uh, discriminate this kind of features, we actually need a very large number of features, not uh, not few. Uh, we should be used uh, more than uh, one, one, more than thousand, not to, uh, to do a, a, a good detection. And as you can see, the prediction we associate the, the appearance with the, the learned features, and then we, uh, we um, associate the, the direction of this figure. Uh, for the object, we collect uh, a lot of uh, instances of the, the object uh, appearance from the trajectory of the motion, and then we uh, learn features to uh, present the object, even if it has the uh, most composed and uh, and not very segmentation around. Um, so here you can see the results when applying these uh, boundary features to uh, new images. Again, uh, this is done in a full generalized uh, approach. So these uh, objects that were not seen during training, but still uh, you can have a pretty good sense of what's uh, in front, what's behind, and even uh, you can, can see that uh, not, we not, don't just get the figure ground between the object and the version, but also uh, an object that uh, has a more topological um, uh, figure, we can get even further uh, depth cubes and uh, depth on the object itself. Uh, from the uh, global object uh, detector, uh, get a, a more complete detection of the object, but it's not very accurate around the boundary. And then, when combined two approaches, uh, get very uh, nice and uh, 
uh, precise uh, segmentation uh, of the object and also the information of where is the figure is the uh, Even if, uh, if we take a more sophisticated uh, segmentation algorithm and feed uh, this kind of map into it, so Shimon uh, talked about the uh, about the, the graph cut of segmentation. So this is kind of an algorithm that is present in the PowerPoint. It's called a graph cut, and it's a variation of the graph cut. Uh, but if you apply it to our images, uh, just with no cues, so this is the way uh, it's being segmented. But if we give it uh, our maps as a cue, so you can see that it performs much better uh, on the uh, figure. Um, so, uh, I have five more minutes, so uh, I will just briefly uh, talk about the work that is going on uh, and uh, is still uh, um, in research about the object uh, containers. Um, so, there are many types of containers and they are uh, particularly interesting because they have very um, important uh, functionality uh, uh, for humans um, and also other species uh, uh, may learn to, to use this kind of containers but uh, it's not that any object can be a container and uh, it appears that uh, infants uh, are actually uh, pretty good at it uh, also in the first year of life uh, just uh, to show you some kind of uh, experiment that are uh, uh, being done on infants. So uh, these are three uh, samples, examples of containment. The one is uh, an object with, which is uh, uh, loosely contained in a, in a basket. Another one, which is uh, something more, uh, uh, looks like more, some more mechanical, but very tight. Uh, container and uh, other type of container. So these uh, these are uh, um, habituation examples uh, that are being shown to infants, and then they are being tested. A again, first the uh, the object is uh, uh, near the, the container, but in this time the container is upside down, and when the, the object is being put uh, on the container on the container, not inside. So uh, infants uh, show longer look looking time, which means that they are surprised that this happened, and uh, it's a different event than it was uh, in the situation. Uh, this happens uh, around uh, uh, nine months of age, and sometimes a bit later, but certainly not their earlier. This is a different experiment that is being done with the containers. So the first uh, experiment uh, uh, container is being put behind the, the occluder, the, the, behind the container, and then uh, at the test event, the container is being pushed aside. On the other uh, case, uh, an object is being put inside the container, and then, again, the test, uh, in the test, when the container is pushed aside, the, the object is revealed behind it. So, in this case, uh, infants show uh, much surprise when this, uh, this event happens because they expect the container to be transferred with the, uh, with the container and not be revealed behind it. Um, so this is a very uh, complex uh, um, concept to understand, and uh, we we were looking uh, a little bit of ways uh, of ways how to uh, can uh, we can learn in an unsupervised manner, and again we want to use the, the notion of motion and uh, try to get uh, all the variation loose and tight fit, uh, etc. Uh, so this is just to uh, give you uh, a taste of what we are doing. So we are uh, we are training on uh, this kind of event where 
objects are being uh, stored and put in a, a container during which uh, we need to learn all the uh, all what happens between the, the object and the container, especially about the boundaries. We can detect the external boundaries and external boundaries, and then, given a static image, we can infer whether the object is being put in front, behind, inside. Um, so uh, everything is being learned from the, the dynamic event, and then uh, the model uh, is being able to predict about the static. Um, so let me summarize and say that uh, different uh, uh, complex concepts such as hands and direction of gaze, uh, static uh, object segregation are very hard to uh, learn and, uh, in a more general statistic uh, approach. Uh, but if we use a specific use that uh, can be either innate or very early down. Uh, during the first uh, month of age, uh, it is possible to learn those uh, very complex uh, cues. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, it, it's 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 possible to learn those uh, to learn uh, those. Uh, um, uh, concepts uh, just by uh, using these uh, cues as internal uh, teaching signals that can then be, be applied to uh, regular supervised uh, uh, mechanisms of learning uh, and facilitate the, the learning uh, and uh, enable then further learning of more difficult and uh, complex uh, concepts. So thank you, and if you have any questions. So it's a, it's a nice idea uh, which can say something about uh, when, when objects are related to different uh, sources of illumination. Uh, the thing is that <coughs> if we want to relate uh, human uh, responses to this kind of object, so it's a little bit uh, less of a strong signal, I think, because uh, we humans not control the sources of illumination. So all objects around us will respond similarly uh, to these uh, sources of illumination if, if they are changing uh, through time, but they will not uh, distinguish between uh, objects that draw our attention more than others. And in this uh, case, uh, uh, mover uh, project, uh, we wanted to see whether there is a specific signal that uh, we can uh, lock onto and just uh, train on these examples whenever this kind of event is happening uh, to, to grab the, both the, the face appearance and the, the specific uh, place of attention. So in that sense, uh, it's more uh, specific. Uh, 